For more than three centuries, the Negro in America has been in turn slave, lackey, hired help, licensed clown, who mostly gave to America his cheap labor and his powerful, melancholy music. His lowly status has mocked and only recently challenged the old American declaration that all men are created equal. In general, the Negro is at the bottom of the heap. He has less schooling, worse health, more infant mortality, double or triple the unemployment rate of the whites. He is a permanent invalid in American society. And the places he lives, whether in the town or the country, Now sometimes it does seem in some places that he's not much better off uh, than he was when Jefferson feared that the condition of the Negro might ring a fire bell in the night. Let's go back to the beginning and listen to some words that were written 190 years ago. They were put down by Jefferson at the end of a day after he'd seen a planter abusing a slave while the planter's son stood by. The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it. The parent storms, the child looks on and puts on the same airs in the circle of smaller slaves. And thus nursed, educated, and daily exercised in tyranny cannot but be stamped by it with odious peculiarities. The man must be a prodigy who can retain his manners and morals undepraved by such circumstances. I bit the fruit, open my eyes, divide the truth from the lies. Evil rabbis with suit and ties on Palm Sundays, I'm on the Mondays, and stay calm on Tuesdays when crews are sprayed, afraid of Wednesdays. His friends lay in coffins. I made it through abortion and move with caution. The midnight offering and deep nights, the peace pipes at nights, religious sacrifice, paying tithes to an antichrist. White robes and reading strolls, my dark souls take a stroll. Round the solar system, the wisdom of the fortune teller from the depths of a scorching sun. Hot his face with the umbrella And once the night falls Fill the synagogues Holding feast to the golden beast In the tabernacle Shackled by the son of a jackal With the face of a tabernacle Know you not that you was a curse And unworthy for the mercy Since Eve and Adam had a polluted orgasm Causes cramps and back spasm Worship the sex The wages of sin is death Condemns the flesh They worship black ravens and graven idols Giving heed to pagan titles Sin men raging and rivals Reading all sorts of Bibles For survival Death haunts the mental The evil 
that the men do The red dots of the Hindu The serpent tattoo The witch's brew The priest voodoo The black magic The devil sabbath Taboo Religious practice From the hourglasses The crystal ball The magic wand The step beyond the wrath of Kong Many are called Many are few are chosen Many are chosen I suppose today the word slave calls up an image of a man wholly black, a man sold in Africa by black men to British or American shippers and then put up on an auction block somewhere in the West Indies or the American South. When the slave arrived here, in Protestant North America at any rate, he would have no hope, as he had in Catholic Brazil, of working out his freedom. He would be set to work on a rice or tobacco plantation and watched from dawn to dusk by an overseer. His whole life would be spent within the confines of his master's domain. He was usually not allowed to marry or form lasting attachments. They would produce in time more hands for work, but at once more mouths to feed. But if his lot here below was miserable, he was encouraged to hope for pie in the sky. And he was freely allowed, then as now, the consolations of religion. It's up to you today yeah. to cap the track of good yeah. and if I give you the right communication. Yeah. Then, then, then you will be a friend to me. Yeah. You will be a just man. Yeah. The house is a beauty. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yet, to the foreign visitor, the hardships of this laboring society were cloaked with a facade of great natural beauty and elegant living. But always behind the facade was the force that maintained it, the labor force that the southerners called the peculiar institution. These are the uh, slave cabins, I suppose you could call them, and rather more imposing than most. These were built in 1740 by the slaves themselves. And these were reserved for the house servants. The laboring slaves had their smaller huts in the woods and the fields beyond. As you see, they're pretty solid and now in disrepair. In each cabin, one, two, possibly three families were born, lived, died. Whole generations lived their lives away in these huts and the fields in which they worked.
In many plantations, they ran away, and there was no place to hide. There were small, fierce insurrections, and they were put down. I suppose nothing is more permanent in human nature than indignation by hindsight. There are people running around who say, Jefferson had slaves, so he was a hypocrite. I remember when I first came to this country, I was disturbed by the separate signs, black and white, that you saw in restaurants and dividing off sections in theaters and trains and so on. And uh, it seemed to me then that the Negro was a sore thumb sticking up through the Declaration of Independence. But I didn't shudder, as Americans did and do, at the inhumanity of sending eight-year-old boys away to boarding school. I think it all depends on the conventions that you were brought up with. After all, Franklin Roosevelt was a humane man, and so were my many Southern friends. And I decided that uh, it was their country, and perhaps they knew best. Now, this is scandalously insensitive today, and it's caught up with us. And the Negro has a long way to go, but he has come further in the last 30 years than in the previous 300. Well, by the time of the American Revolution, half the population of Virginia were black slaves, and in the Carolinas, it was two blacks to one white. Now, many Southerners, as you must have gathered from that anguished passage of Jefferson, felt ashamed, humiliated, by their ownership of slaves. George Washington, by the way, he performed his own act of emancipation by setting his slaves free in his will. But the slave trade was too profitable to the northern shipper and too vital to the economy of the South to be abolished. It was abolished in 1808, that's to say the legal importation of slaves from Africa. Indeed, long before then, the port of Savannah in Georgia had hoped to prosper without them. Savannah was planned by an English humanitarian, a greatly admired friend of Dr. Johnson, James Oglethorpe. It was his ambition to make of Georgia a decorative, ideal colony that should be free from, as he put it, the stain of slavery. But white men had no taste for stoop labor under a tropical sun. And then, Around the turn of the 18th century, something happened that made slaves more desirable than ever and the bootleg trade in them more lucrative than the legal trade. That something was the cotton kingdom. In the autumn of 1792, a young man, fresh from Yale College, arrived in Savannah. His name was Eli Whitney. He took a boat up the Savannah River. He was a northerner the son of a Massachusetts farmer, and he was at once impressed and moved by the strangeness of the landscape and the bird sounds and the primal life on the bayous. He was going to his first job as a school teacher on a plantation in Georgia and to a boy from a snowbound New England farm, his first sight of the South must have seemed as exotic as a journey to Siam. Young Whitney was a recluse, an inquisitive, brooding type, what today we should call a loner. In his native north, he had to do all the chores of a farm, but his mania was carpentry and mechanics. As a boy, he'd amazed his family by disappearing to his workbench for days on end and reappearing with wheel rims, polished axles, hat pins, finely ground knives, clocks, needles, metalwork, fiddles, all of his own construction. Well, one evening in Georgia, he sat in silence at a dinner party and listened to some southern planters in a bitter lamentation about the tedium and the cost of cleaning cotton. It took 20 slaves a whole day to pick and clean the cotton. Now, this was an old and nagging problem. The precious part is the lint. What you had to get rid of were these bothersome seeds, and they're as hard as peas, 
embedded in there, they just had to be pulled out by hand and separated like that. And there was no machine, no device ever contrived that could do it until they could separate their own sea island and green seed cottons they could not compete now until this visit to georgia eli whitney of course had never seen any species of cotton but he was fascinated by the problem and in the next few days he went off to a carpenter's shop that the family had rigged up for him and he tried out all kinds of shapes of cylinders and he pulled draw knives over them and nothing worked. And then he tells us in a letter, one day he saw a cat sitting by a fence that enclosed a poultry yard, and the cat could just get one paw through the fence and held it there like a pointer, poised, waiting for a strolling chicken, and then darted the paw forward, missed the chicken, but retrieved a paw full of feathers and in this he saw a principle of friction and separation and he applied it and he came up with this the cotton gin this is an actual demonstration model that was made by whitney himself and it's preserved for us in the smithsonian institution in washington which is where we now are like so many awesome discoveries like the propositions of euclid it was so simple that it seemed incredible nobody had thought of it any day after the invention of the wheel. Well, here it is. A wooden cylinder implanted with metal spikes divided, as you see, by metal bars. And you take a piece of raw cotton and drop it in, turn the crank, and you shed the seeds into the box, and up comes here the pure lint. Whitney calculated that a hand machine like this could do the work of 10 slaves, of 50 slaves if it was driven by water. It was so simple, so obvious that every rude wheelwright could make it. And it was Whitney's misfortune that most of them did. Trying to monopolize a thing like this was like taking out a patent on a shoelace. But the thing itself in all its forms gave a gigantic lift to the fortunes of the southern planters. Then, less than two years after Whitney's invention, a Frenchman in New Orleans made sugar granulate from boiling sugar cane. So now also a sugar empire turned the hot, wet delta lands of Louisiana into more fortunes and yet another recruiting ground for black slaves. How to get it to the north? The Mississippi has a powerful downstream flow and treacherous currents. They tried and failed to pull boats upstream with teams of horses on the banks. Then in 1811, New Orleans built the first steamboat and solved the problem of upstream navigation. They started shipping cargoes of raw sugar up the Mississippi for refining as far as St. Louis, Louisville, and Cincinnati. 20 years after the first steamboat went up the river, New Orleans boasted that it had the largest sugar refinery in the world and was the capital port of King Cotton.
So now the South settled into its golden age. The sugar went up the river and on the return journey the steamboats picked up the cotton from new plantations started far inland on the banks of the Mississippi. The first stop the steamboats made was here at Natchez, a town that had been ruled successively by the Indians, the French, the British, the Spanish, and was only recently American. Before the coming of the cotton gin, it had been a frontier capital and a rough one a loading place for the flat boatmen taking aboard their rafts, skins and hams and tobacco and grains and whiskey. It was a way station for pioneers going west into the new lands and a boom town for land agents and fly-by-night real estate men. Land was cheap and money was easy to make and lose. New farmers found that tobacco here didn't pay but with the cotton gin, the land bloomed. And in time, so did the new rich, from the south, but also from the north, and even from Scotland and Ireland. They built new houses on the models that the French and Spanish had given them, but the grandest mansions followed the conservative fashion of the Greek revival. this house was an Irishman, Frederick Stanton, and he was one who profited royally from the mating of the cotton gin and the steamboat. In 1852 he sold his first big house to Natchez's first millionaire, and he decided to build something bigger and better of his own. And this is it, Stanton Hall. It's characteristic of the mid-century southern tycoons that though they admired and retained the classical forms outdoors, indoors they packed their houses with the gaudiest, the most funereal early Victoriana. He was a cotton broker, and uh, after the steamboat he was able to ship his cotton north to Memphis and all the northern ports of the Mississippi and down the river to New Orleans and out to Europe and particularly to Manchester. He was a type that I think you could say anticipated the more lordly habits of the later financial barons. You see, this house took five years to complete, and towards the end of the work, Stanton grew a little, just a little impatient with the regular timetables of the transatlantic ships, so he chartered his own liner to fetch the furniture and the mirrors and the expensive baubles that he'd bought or had made to order in Europe. They were reshipped at New Orleans, came up the river, were unloaded here in Natchez. And here they are, mantles of Carrara marble, bronze chandeliers also from Italy, two giant matching French mirrors, and mahogany doors made in England. It was a far cry from Natchez, Mississippi to Savannah, Georgia, and from the new fortunes to the old. But to cross the thousand miles that separated them, you would have seen the same crop, the same source of wealth, the same lifeline, the same legions of the blacks. It's time to leave this graceful, feudal cotton kingdom and go back to the north, as Eli Whitney did, to devise in these factories of his a method of making a uniform product with interchangeable parts. It no longer required special skill to make a gun or later a sewing machine. Moles could produce identical parts that had always had to be made by the hands of skilled craftsmen. It was the fateful turning point between craftsmanship and industry and it heralded all the benefits and all the troubles of mass production. 
witness ingenuity in two places had given a tragic guarantee that the North would embrace the Industrial Revolution and the South would reject it. That the North would go one way and the South another and that sooner or later they would collide. The historical fact is that the South was spreading cotton and tobacco and sugar into new land and extending the empire of slavery through the South and West while into the North and West were pouring men and machines and most of all independent farmers. They were very much against slavery, not so much on principle. They'd expected to go west and work free land for their own prosperity. And they certainly did not expect to compete with slave labor. So the very awkward question came up. What would happen when the two streams of settlers flowed together on the same ground. Let's look at the map. And this is the actual map of the times. The first frightening omen, and Thomas Jefferson called it a fire bell in the night, came so early as 1819 when Missouri asked to come in as a state. Now Missouri had been settled by slaveholders, but it lies, as you see, north of the tumbling horizontal line that divided the free states of the north from the slave states of the south. If Missouri were let in as a slave state, a northerner would look at this map and see a precedent, an invasion, at best a buffer state. Well, the Congress let Missouri in as a slave state, but to maintain its usual habit of balancing one free, one slave, it also let Maine in as a free state. But in the same act, it prohibited from then on all slavery north of this line of latitude 3630. It is known as the Missouri Compromise Line and it drew a battle line. This geographical balance lasted precariously for about 30 years. And then the United States fought a war with Mexico and won and acquired vast lands most of them south of the Missouri Compromise Line. Texas, territory of New Mexico, California, and Utah, well to the north. Now this, you see, presented a massive challenge to the Missouri Compromise, and it inspired massive enmity, which festered for a couple of years or so, and came to a head, as all great issues do, in the United States Senate, which is where we are now. We're in the Senate reception room. And on the opposite wall there, I see a portrait of the last man, the last great political figure, to try and reconcile the North and the South. His name was Henry Clay, and he was from Kentucky. He gave 60 years of his life to a failing campaign to abolish slavery, beginning in his own state. But in spite of his ardent feelings, he was known as the great compromiser. He looks a whole lot younger and healthier here than he did when he stood on the Senate floor to give the last speech of his life. He was 83, haggard, racked with asthma, and he talked for two days, and this was his solution. Let the North return all fugitive slaves. Let California be admitted as a free state. Give to the territories of Utah and New Mexico the time and the freedom to decide when, if ever, they want slavery. And let the new state of Texas keep the slave system it had always had. Well, the compromise was voted and grudgingly accepted by both sides. But then came one of those frightening decades in American history when fear, on the one hand, and self-righteousness, on the other, combine to seize a public issue. Of course, there were fair, high-minded men in every part of the country, but they were drowned in a boiling sea of rhetoric and propaganda. There was a secret highway worked out by abolitionists in defiance of the federal law to help fugitive slaves escape from the South. At least 50,000 of them got away through this underground. And there was a maniacal egotist from Connecticut, John Brown, who raided a federal arsenal with the intention of arming slaves in the South. 
He was caught, tried, and hanged. But oddly, his name goes marching on in a song. In spite of expressions of moral outrage from North and South and the legal abolition of the slave trade, Eli Whitney's cotton gin had made the South's plantation economy boom from the Atlantic to the Mississippi. And the introduction of the steamboat opened up a great new distribution network along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. But in the North, the Industrial Revolution had spurred the growth of a factory economy and sooner or later the two opposing systems would collide over the issue of slavery. They retreated into an equally self-righteous defiance and soon the word secession became a badge of southern pride. The last fatal blow was struck by, of all healing institutions, the Supreme Court of the United States. A Negro slave, Dred Scott, from a slave state, Missouri, had lived for some time in a free state, Illinois, with his old master's permission. When he went home again, he sued in court to have himself declared a free man. In a fatal decision, the Supreme Court ruled that whether or not you could argue that a Negro was a citizen, a slave was not. The laws of Missouri were binding. In a word, the court said that Congress was powerless to exclude slavery from a free state. From then on, the two nations, for that was what in fact they had become, almost resolutely fell apart. On the 12th of April, 1861, the Southerners unloosed their fire on a federal fort, Fort Sumter, built on a sandbar in the mouth of Charleston Harbor. A house divided against itself, said Lincoln, cannot stand a casual sentence that immediately had a piercing relevance to the army regulars. If they came from the South, they had to choose which side to be on. Two brothers were major generals with the opposing armies. The commander of the Confederate Navy had a son killed in the Union Navy. And Mrs. Abraham Lincoln's three brothers died for the South. I doubt that any war is more wounding to the young than a civil war, which turns the homeland into alien country and a map of bloody family feuds. In the beginning, the northerners thought, as one side always does, that the war would be over by Christmas. The north had 22 million people against 9 million in the south. The North had all the advantages. It had the steel to make its guns and materiel. The South had to buy them from France and Britain. New York alone produced twice as many manufactured goods as the whole of the South. The North had 22,000 miles of unified railroads, and the South only 9,000 miles of track of various gauges. For all these disparities, camp life on both sides was about equally primitive. Country boys, until they were talked into a little elementary hygiene, into the magic of carbolic soap, dropped like swatted flies. Amputation was the regular cure for a badly wounded limb. And if you survived, you had one chance in four of dying from infection. But gradually the huge experience of gunshot wounds brought new knowledge to medicine, to neurology in particular. And after two years, the battlefield use of anesthetics became routine. For the northern armies, high-minded men and women formed something called the National Sanitary Commission, which started veterans' pensions, organized nursing wards at the front, and faced the human problems of the men who went home again. For the Southerners, there was only the compassion of scattered families and the hope that the next raid would seize some of the drugs and the chloroform which Abraham Lincoln barred from shipment to the Southern armies. Why then did it go on for four years? 
The South had the resources of a vast granary, but its human resources were its strength. It had more adroit and disciplined generals who developed great skill at fighting along interior lines. It had the Southern people, and all they wanted was to prove that their homeland was unconquerable. To this day, the moment you leave Washington and cross the Potomac into Virginia, the highways throughout the whole arc of the South for a thousand miles are posted with historical markers that tick off placid fields as the scene of ghastly encounters. We're in one of them now, in southern Tennessee. It is called Shiloh, and it's only one of a whole poem of remembered place names. They toll through the American memory like an elegy. Antietam and Vicksburg, Manassas and Bull Run, Chattanooga and Chancellorville and Gettysburg. They were unforgettable even down to our own time. I once knew a very old man with a huge chiseled face and a great snowy moustache and a blazing eye. And he was a, I would say, a, a New England aristocrat of immense reserve. But he couldn't help beginning his entry in Husu with this. Born March the 8th, 1841. Captain 20th Massachusetts Volunteers. Wounded in the breast at Ball's Bluff. In the heel at Fredericksburg. In the neck at Antietam. Nevertheless, he survived to become the most distinguished jurist in the English-speaking world. His name was Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. I still find it hard to believe that I met a man who was wounded in the American Civil War. When you think that his comrades have been dead for over a hundred years, their only lasting memorial is the photographs they had taken when they first put on their uniform. Just before the battle, mother, I am thinking most of you. While upon the fields we're watching with the enemy, Comrades brave are round me lying Filled with thoughts of home and God For well they know that on the morrow Some will sleep beneath the sun But oh, you'll not forget me, mother, if I'm numbered with the slain. The North had the reserves, but the Southerners had the audacity, and the best of them fought with a single-minded passion behind the last gentle knight of modern warfare, General Robert E. Lee. A man so, so deeply humane that it's incredible to us, to me at any rate, that he should have chosen the profession of soldiering. When the slavery issue came to a boil, Lee made quite clear where he stood. He wrote, slavery is a moral and political evil in any society, a greater evil to the white man than the black, and he freed his slaves. We are in his study, the very simple Victorian study as you see. This is the little chess set that he carried with him on all his campaigns. And he even took this desk on campaign with him too. When the war started, he faced an acute moral conflict. You know, it's always a, always a shock to recall that Lincoln offered him the command of the northern forces, and he could have taken it on principle.
because he believed very strongly that secession was unconstitutional. But through five generations, all his loyalties and his affections were with Virginia. He spent a day and a night padding around upstairs trying to resolve this ordeal. And at the end of it, he wrote a letter to his son. He said that he believed in the Union, but a Union that can only be maintained by swords and bayonets has no charm for me. So he went back to Virginia, offered his services, and was put in command of the Southern forces. And by a tragic irony, he came to believe in a principle that Lincoln later was to attribute solely to the Northern cause, which was the right of a people, how about the people of Virginia, to govern themselves, so that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I doubt that Alexander the Great or Napoleon commanded such respect, you might even say reverence, from his troops as Robert E. Lee. There's an incident when one time 15,000 soldiers were marching along a road at night and they heard that nearby Lee was asleep and that without any orders they broke their march and they all tiptoed by. A few days after Fort Sumter, he left this house and he never came back again. And within a few more days, it was a northern camp and then a graveyard. The Secretary of War saw to it that no one would want to live there again by ordering that soldiers' graves should be planted as close to the house as possible. Later, the place was confiscated by the government and became a military cemetery and is now the national military cemetery not only for soldiers. This light on the grave of John F. Kennedy is a perpetual reminder of the bad day in Dallas in 1963. And this cross on the grave of Robert F. Kennedy, a reminder of the bad night in Los Angeles five years later. I don't suppose there's a more beautiful, bleak view in all America than this, from the porch of a saintly man who might have commanded the Union but lost the South, looking over the graves of two murdered brothers, across the river to yet another murdered president, the man who, more than any northern soldier, was Lee's opposing figure. We are talking, of course, about that bemused country boy, frontier farmer, carpenter, drifter, rail splitter, lawyer, tough and wily politician whose rude boyhood we looked at last time, Abraham Lincoln. This is the room in the White House where he sat down with his cabinet and he used to rest when he was overcome, as he often was, with what he called a profound melancholia. He was never wildly popular when he was alive, especially at the beginning of the war. Like all strong characters, he was well hated. And many newspapers, including the London Times, called him the baboon. Now, I think this was a, a very snobby thing. It was mainly because of his country manners and his gangling gait and his fondness for rough stories. And his maddening habit of being in a kind of tooth-sucking way, wiser and sharper than you, to make it worse, he was. He did lead the winning side. He did, in this room, sign the proclamation emancipating the Negro slaves in the slave states. And then he was assassinated. And so he was canonized because a halo encircles all the murdered presidents and Lincoln most of all. Now this room is now a guest bedroom, but some people who come here are just overpowered by it. It has accommodated all kinds of dignitaries, heads of state, 
Prince Philip, Bob Hope. But there are some people who have this worship of Lincoln, who feel when they enter this room that they're coming into a, a crypt or a, a private chapel. I remember when uh, Adlai Stevenson was summoned here by Harry Truman to be told that he was the Democrats' heir apparent. He was put to stay the night in this room and Stevenson worshipped Lincoln and he padded around the room for many hours and he kept looking at this bed and in the end he just couldn't do it. He just could not bed down in Lincoln's bed. So he bedded down on that sofa. The joke is that in Lincoln's day the bed wasn't here, the sofa was. So you see it's, it's difficult, almost tasteless, to talk sense about such a man. But we must try. First, he dignified the trade of politician perhaps more than any man before or since. He had an extraordinary sense of the humanity of quite inhuman people and tolerated them long enough to win them over. Powerful men who were really the scum of the Republic gun contractors, war profiteers, wheeler dealers of every stripe. He learned pretty quickly about war and having started by firing every general in sight if he spotted a character flaw, in the end he chose the best and he had so little egomania that he said to them, when you are in the field you are the Union. And then by some brain chemistry that's never been explained he transformed his whole style of speaking and writing. His early speeches are full of the usual fustian of the time. Then he steeped himself in three books, in the subtleties of Shakespeare, the cadences of the Bible, and the tough humanity of Robert Burns. And he became what he was, a shrewd, honorable frontiersman of very great gifts. Never did he use these gifts more movingly than in a small town in Pennsylvania, Gettysburg. In three sweltering days in July 1863, it had seen over 150,000 men fight for every hill and creek and pasture and a cemetery gate. Only three months after the battle, this cemetery was dedicated as a memorial before a restless crowd milling in the stinking air of shallow graves and rotting bodies. It was here that Lincoln made the short speech which alone has immortalized him among the English-speaking peoples. At the time, the speech was not only disregarded, it was thought to be either a bore or a discredit to a solemn occasion. 43,000 men were killed or missing or wounded at Gettysburg, a single slaughter not matched again until the Second Battle of the Somme. Lee's men never again penetrated so far north. When Gettysburg was over, there were many more battles and almost two years to go, but it was the flood tide of southern hopes. From then on, Britain and France backed away from all the seductive appeals to come in on the southern side. And at the end of it, what? The south was beaten and much worse, it was devastated. The cotton kingdom was destroyed, the plantation system with all its evils and its virtues was debauched. Four million slaves were freed, but there was nowhere for them to go. The land, simply the natural richness of the land and the man-made culture of the South were defiled. In a single long march of 60,000 men from Atlanta to the sea, General Sherman destroyed every town, rail yard, mansion, crop, across a swathe of 60 miles. Oh, we made a thoroughfare for freedom and her train, 60 miles in latitude, 300 to the main. Treason fled before us, resistance was in vain. While we were marching through Georgia, hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that makes you free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea. While we were marching through Georgia. So the Union held. At what a price 
Germany, after the Second War, was hardly so badly off as the conquered South. And it was not only conquered, it was now to be punished. It took the most strenuous efforts of General Grant to prevent Lee and the other Confederate generals from being brought to a Nuremberg trial. They were traitors, weren't they? That's what the Northern politicians thought, and they said if the Southerners get their rights back, they'll run the Congress and the country. So, several Southern states were put under military control, and in these and others, the whites were totally disenfranchised, and the state governments were run by Negroes who could barely read or write. And they were controlled by northern idealists, to be sure, but by also by southern renegades and by northern businessmen and salesmen who descended on the south like locusts. It planted a trauma in the southern whites. And when the reaction came, which it did very swiftly, the Negroes were swept from power and from all the voting booths. And they never entered them again for many decades. The Negro was once again a hireling, never to be trusted as an equal. He'd been pitied and despised, indulged even. Now he was feared. And I think that is the root of the trauma from which, after a century, we're only now beginning to recover. Meanwhile, every spring, docile tourists troop through the old battlefields and the southern gardens and the mansions either surviving or restored. And occasionally they come on these reminders of the power and the glory that will never be restored.